So to start things off, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Brent Iverson, who is both an acclaimed organic chemistry professor and the recently appointed dean of the School of Undergraduate Studies. He is the, sec <laughs> he is the second person to hold the position after inaugural dean, Dr. Paul Woodruff. Dr. Iverson graduated from Stanford University in 1982 with a Bachelor of Science in Chemistry. He then went on to earn his PhD in Chemistry at the California Institute of Technology in 1987. Following that, he performed his postdoctoral work at Scripps Research Institute in California from 1987 to 1990. In 1990, Dr. Iverson joined us at the University of Texas as an assistant professor <coughs> in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry. He continued his time here at the university, becoming a professor and a member of the Institute of Cellular and Molecular Biology. In 2010, he became the chairman of the Department of, Bio of Chemistry and Biochemistry. Over the course of his career, Dr. Iverson has garnered numerous honors and awards for his work in the field of chemistry, including the University of Texas Board of Reagents Outstanding Teaching Award and the Margaret C. Berry Award for Contributions to UT Student Life. It is truly our honor to have him with us today, and so without further ado, we would like to welcome Dr. Iverson, and I hand it over to him. Okay, we're on. And what I'd like to do today is I'd like to tell you a story, it's more like a journey in basic science. So what I'm going to warn you about right now, it's not going to end with, and we cured this disease. Uh, what I'm going to tell you about, though, is the surprising twists and turns that can follow a research program as you investigate something new. And what I hope to get you excited about is the possibilities, the breadth of what can be accomplished, but also the potential that really does exist when you start seeing things in a new way. In particular, I'm going to focus on non-covalent interactions. Non-covalent interactions, those are the things that happen between molecules, not the kind of interactions that occur between atoms that are bonded in molecules. So the reason that I'm interested in that can be described by this picture. This is one of many proteins that I could have shown. It's an antibody molecule. And it's really one of the reasons we're all alive. But what's really interesting to me about this molecule is its size and complexity. It is far larger at 155,000 molecular weight than the molecules generally studied in the organic chemistry laboratory, which generally are on the order of about 250 to 500 molecular weight. 150,000, 250 to 500. It's really quite a dramatic difference. Why does this molecule have the incredible function that it has? It's because of its size, complexity, asymmetry. It's very asymmetric. And it's got an incredible function. It binds to things that are foreign, keeps us alive. How does it work? How does the structure work? It works mostly on non-covalent interactions. There's four polypeptide chains. Just think of them as long pieces of spaghetti that specifically fold up into a three-dimensional geometry based on interactions between different features on that molecule, the non-covalent interactions that make it happen. It's that glue that holds it together. There's a lot of ways we can think about chemistry progressing in the future. One of the most important, I think, is that we as chemists are going to be able to harness non-covalent interactions to try to create these very large, complex, asymmetric, and hopefully functional molecules. And so what I'm going to tell you about today is a specific type of non-covalent interaction that I've been working with for the last 20 years. And it involves these two structures, so-called DAN and NDI. All you need to know is that they have complementary electrostatics. They're both flat. This molecule has a lot of density, electron density, in its middle. This, part, this molecule does not. Opposite charges attract. So I'm oversimplifying it a ton, but for the purposes of tonight, the best thing to think about is negative charge binds to positive charge. But these aren't full charges. These are partial charges that were calculated using quantum mechanics. These molecules have the same size, and this complementarity means that, for example, if you crystallize them, they will crystallize in this fashion, in this alternating fashion, because the positive and the negative are complementary. That one interaction has led to a number of different kinds of molecular systems that I want to tell you about. 
So I'm not going to spend very much time talking about any one interaction or any one type of molecule, but I hope what you'll take from this is this simple idea. Let's use these structures to assemble things can be used in a variety of different ways, and it's even led us to surprising, some surprising things we never would have anticipated. The bottom line is I'm going to divide this talk into two pieces. The first is what happens when we do the, this kind of assembly in water, a highly polar interacting solvent. It turns out that they tend to stack in this face-to-face, face-centered -face, face fashion. What can we do with that? Well, early on, we made molecules that would fold up. So we alternated these, we linked them together, they folded up. May not seem like a big deal. Turns out that was the first time that's ever been done, that human, has ever, a human beings had ever designed a molecule that actually folded up. Now, that's a far cry from the antibody molecule, but it's a baby step. It's a start. We then got a little bolder and said, OK, let's try to do something really interesting. Let's take two chains of these. They're complementary now. Let's take a chain of one and a chain of the other and see if they'll assemble like that. And in fact, they did. In one of my all-time favorite experiments, we were able to show that with no other complementarity than these different electrostatic distributions on the two different aromatic molecules, the big flat ones are called aromatic, the rings, that in fact, they will assemble. Those of you familiar with molecular biology might mistake that for a DNA gel, where you have two complementary strands of DNA that come together because of specific hydrogen bonding patterns. Well, we are able to mimic that with nothing more than the complementarity of where the charges were on the two different aromatic chains. And so we we're able to put that together. Again, that's not something that is going to get your attention beyond what might happen in the laboratory. But now we're starting to get a little bit brazen and said, all right, what if we use that same complementarity not just to assemble chains, but let's do it in the context of DNA. So in, in a paper that we just published, and I love the title because this is a title, it's every permutation of DA and N. So I just kind of think that's kind of funny. We stuck the DAN and the NDI, those units, into DNA itself, replaced the DNA bases, and asked the question, how well does that work? And the answer is, if we put these into the DNA bases, we generate a DNA strand that has R bases in the middle of a normal DNA double helix. They replace AT base pairs, which hydrogen bond like this, simply based on the electrostatic complementarity. And when they do that, they have the same strength of interaction as three sets of AT base pairs. So what we can do is show that this new type of covalent interaction can be used to not only fold molecules, it can also replace things that we're very familiar with, like DNA bases. But what else can we do with it? It turns out we don't need the electron, the red piece. We don't need that electron-rich red piece because the DNA bases themselves can be that red piece. So we asked the question about 15 years ago, what if we start thinking about molecules in this way and can we come up with a strategy for binding to DNA in a more powerful context? Why would you want to do that? I would assert to you that DNA is the ultimate drug target. If you can target DNA, turn on or off transcription as you would like, you can think about treating the diseases that we cannot treat today. You can think about cancer. You can think about retroviral infections like HIV, where the DNA is embedded within your own DNA. You can think about genetic diseases that we don't really know how to treat, because if we can get at the DNA and what happens at the DNA level, we have a chance to treat these. We have a long way to go before that's going to be a reality. But what we need is we need molecules that bind to large pieces of DNA, and they need to be able to stick there and not move. If you're treating a genetic disease, you don't want to take a pill every four hours. Here's the problem. Those are two dramatically different sequences of DNA, atomically resolved. It takes a sharp eye to see the difference. What I'm talking about is making a molecule that will fit and bind only to that region of DNA, but not that DNA, all based on this idea of these aromatics being complementary. So I'm going to zoom ahead now several years of work and show you this molecule. Took several graduate students years of their lives to come up with that structure. But that structure does something really quite remarkable. It actually targets that sequence of DNA and only that sequence of DNA. 
Here's the concept. Let's make a molecule that binds to DNA like a snake might climb a ladder. It goes back and forth through the DNA. This blue disk is the same blue disk we were folding up and doing other things with before. But we're going to link it in such a way that it binds so that once bound, it becomes very difficult for that to come back off. So think about this. That piece is going to have difficulty moving out of the DNA double helix because that has to move first. And that kind of trap is what we were going for. Not only that, we adjust this parts of the, these parts of the molecule, these purple linkers, to bind specific to specific bases, specific sequences. And there it is. I don't have time to explain all the details of this experiment. Trust me. I'm going to be saying that a lot for the next 10 minutes. Trust me. The fact that that is blank on this picture says that this molecule binds only to that DNA sequence. We did that by design. It was targeted. And it misses. It does not bind to all the rest of about 400, 600. We've gotten up to 4,000 bases. It doesn't touch. But it will touch exactly that sequence. It's reading the sequence and binding there. But OK, that's neat. We can target DNA. Other people can do that as well. But the question is, how long does it bind? If I'm serious about thinking of DNA as a drug target, you're going to want something that binds on a relevant time scale to a human being. Years, months, something like that. Turns out that trick of tying the molecule almost into a knot when it binds into the DNA worked better than we had ever hoped. So in fact, we set a world's record here by a lot. We actually broke our own. That thing will bind to DNA for 57 days, half-life. No one's even close to that. That was actually hard to measure. Think about that poor graduate student. Set up that experiment and work it up in October. Um, that's essentially what we did. This is the half-life of it binding, is two months. The nice thing about that is now talking about five months, six months, two years, ten years, that becomes within the conversation. So even though we have a long way to go here, I think we've demonstrated that there's a lot of power in this idea of being able to bind these molecules in this fashion and have this unusual geometry. OK. Um, trust me on this. We're now extending binding to the entire binding site, that 22 bases that we were targeting. That's enough to uniquely target a specific site in the entire human genome. So we not only can bind for two months, but we can target very long sequences so we can go after unique places. So that's, that's all making us so that this conversation about maybe using DNA as a drug target, although it's still far off, it's not totally ridiculous anymore. Things starting to look a little bit better. OK, but there was a surprise we learned only three years ago. These molecules that we've been playing with for 20 years, and this is probably my biggest point, you, you just never know what you're going to discover. We found out that there were actually two forms of this. This kind of st stacking where we have the electron deficient and the electron rich units that stack face to face, that's one thing. It turned out that in the absence of, of solvent, it turns out that they like to stack only the NDI piece, the electron deficient part, like to stack in an off-centered mode. What's more, those two geometries have the same energy. And that's the wacky part. That's where things started getting really interesting that these molecules had a trick up their sleeve that can turn into a lot of different things that are really interesting. For example, and I know I don't have time to talk about this. Everyone's familiar with Alzheimer's. One of the major problems with Alzheimer's is that proteins, which have a nice function in the brain, change their shape, and they turn into these long ribbons, which then become what are referred to as fibrils. And that's the diagnostic characteristic of Alzheimer's disease is the presence of those protein fibrils. They screw things up. You go from a folded state to a nice ribbon, a fibril. Well, it turns out we made a molecule that did that because it alternated between that stack geometry and then it assembled according to that offset stacking into a solid, no more solvent. And it turned into fibrils that are absolutely indistinguishable from what happens in Alzheimer's fibril formation. So we learned a lot about that process by studying this molecule. But the key is that we have two states of almost the same energy, and so you can tweak it one way or the other. What else can we do with that? I'm about to leave the world of biology and biochemistry, because we discovered that there's a lot more you can do with molecules that have two states of almost the same energy that are really more interesting from a materials point of view.
Okay, liquid crystals are really cool things. It turns out that what we can do is we can create a system, which we did, that will exploit the difference. So here's what I didn't tell you. When that Dan and NDI molecule stack in an alternating fashion, it turns maroon. Okay, that really sucks if you're at UT, by the way. Because I don't care whether you're talking about Oklahoma, Texas A&M, or Alabama. That's the color. I wish this was burnt orange. It's not. It's maroon. But by balancing the, the parameters exactly right, we were able to create a system that in the liquid crystalline state shown here, it's maroon because it's stacked in an alternating fashion. But upon cooling, it crystallizes into this state here where the molecules are now shifting to favor that other type of stacking. It's almost the same energy. The interesting thing about that, this is a solid that turned colors. I can't read that. One minute? Okay. I thought I was going to get a five minute somewhere. Okay. Um, it's a solid that turns colors. And by the way, that's, and it happens very rapidly, that's something you probably haven't experienced, a solid that turns colors. We created a different kind of molecule along the same principles that shifts between an alternating stacking mode and a face-centered stacking mode. And when that happens, it dramatically changes colors. We can crystallize it in one form and then heat it up and the crystal will stay intact, but now it changes colors. There's only two other materials that have ever been able to show that kind of behavior, and it gets even weirder. It turns out if you press on the orange crystals just a little bit, they turn yellow. Press them. That's how finely tuned this energy difference is. Now we're getting somewhere that I think is really kind of fascinating. What about, and I'll, I'll use bike helmets as an example, what if you had a bike helmet that was painted orange and every time you hit your head real hard it turned yellow and stayed there? Now you can think about having an impact type of application to these kinds of molecules that have these multiple states. And so now we're exploring as much as we can about how different states can be modified in a way that can tell us something about the environment. Now you can start thinking about smart materials. We've made some polymers. They do some really interesting things like that. And it's all based on finely, uh, a, a fine understanding of how these non-covalent interactions between these complementary aromatics can behave. So this is all I really wanted to tell you today, but I just wanted to, to sort of bring you up to speed on what's been going on in my lab for 20 years and, and remind you that science isn't a journey you can predict where you're going to head. And if you get onto something that's relatively new and interesting, it's important just to follow it wherever it leads, whether it's binding to DNA for two months or changing color when you press on something, and yet that really comes down to the exact same interaction. Okay. I think that's it.